titled, The Origin of Species by Natural Selection. As I have alluded to earlier this afternoon, Charles Darwin never had any other earned degree except a degree in theology. So what made Charles Darwin write his book? And why did Charles Darwin want God out of the picture? Charles Darwin had a daughter. Her name was Annie. He was married and this daughter was the delight of his life. She was his joy. She was the apple of his eye. When Annie was 10, she became very, very sick. In fact, she became so sick that they wondered whether she would live or not. Annie was a very religious little girl, as was her mother. They often went to church, they often prayed and did things that religious people do. Annie died. When Annie died, Charles Darwin decided that he could not believe in a God who would allow a little girl like Annie to die. The book Origin of the Species by Natural Selection has been printed and reprinted and several editions have been made. Since 1859, that has been the cornerstone for all of the teaching on evolution that has been done in the schools of our nation. I am holding in my hand the Prentice Hall Science book titled Evolution. I was sitting down on the front row and Will Freeman said, that's the exact book that we used. I was delivering a lecture similar to this in Jacksonville, Alabama. I had 15 people in the lecture. Not very many. But it just so happened that three of the 15, 20% of the young men and women who were in that audience that day had used this book. This is one of the most popular books used to teach basically 5th through 7th graders evolution. I want you to read with me the quote that I gave to you last night by a man named Daniel Dene. Once again, we're going to have to pause here. Somehow my projector keeps getting turned off. So, quick moment of silence. Won't have too much silence there, will we? Okay, I got another dinosaur joke for you in the process. What do you call a big dinosaur that goes into a china shop and breaks everything? A brachiosaurus. Okay, pretty bad, but I made that one up myself too. Pretty bad, okay, I'll give you another one. Two worms, two silkworms got in a race. They ended up in a tie. Just get down. That's a tough one. Okay, you got to be really bright to get that last one. This is what Daniel Dene says about what is going to happen when you send your children to school. Regarding those people who teach their children something other than evolution. He says, those of us who have the freedom of speech will feel free to describe your teachings as the spreading of falsehoods and will attempt to demonstrate that to your children at our earliest convenience. As soon as you send your children to school, as early as first, second, third, fourth grade, those in the schools who have the, as Mr. Denae puts it, freedom of speech will explain to your children that you have been lying to them. And then they will present evidence that supposedly points to evolution. Here is that evidence. What we are going to do for the remainder of this afternoon 
is go through their evidence and see what it actually does say. I want you to look with me at the classic example of evolution. If you'll read down on the bottom, you will see that this is in an Allen and Bacon general science book. Here is what supposedly took place in the early 1900s. In the early 1900s, supposedly, there, no, actually, this is the factual part, there were English peppered moths. The scientific technical name for them is Biston bichelaria. These English peppered moths, before the 1900s, 95% of them were a light color that supposedly blended in with the tree. 5% of them were that dark color that did not blend in with the tree. As the story goes, when the soot and other things from the Industrial Revolution caused the trees to start losing their lichens, that moss, the birds could see the lighter ones better than the darker ones. And so... 95% of the English peppered moth population turned to the darker color and 5% turned to the lighter color. Now I want you to read at the very bottom of that slide with me where it says, Melanism, evolution in action. This is an example, they say, of evolution in action. Now, what Will Freeman and all those other people who have used this book saw was the exact same pictures, same situation. Here is the caption under this picture. After the start of the Industrial Revolution, the light gray bark of trees was darkened by the soot from factories. In each photograph, which peppered moth would mo most likely be noticed by a hungry bird. How did population affect the way that natural selection acted upon the peppered moth? Here it is. Evolution in action. Some of the strongest evidence available to teach your children evolution. Now let's look at it critically for just a second. Number one. Did the English peppered moths ever change into anything other than an English peppered moth? Did they ever change into a half moth, half lizard? Did they ever develop a body part like a, a scale along with maybe their antenna? They started out with a black, darker colored moth and a lighter colored moth, although the population was a little bit different percentage, and they ended up with a black, darker colored moth, and a lighter colored moth, started with a dark light one, ended with a dark light one. What did the English peppered moth actually change into? Nothing. An English peppered moth. So if this supposed evidence does anything for you, it shows you that English peppered moths always stay English peppered moths. But that's not really why I'm using this example. The reason I'm using this example is because the information in this book is absolutely false. We've been studying English peppered moths now for 25 years. And in those 25 years, we have found exactly two English peppered moths that have ever landed on a tree trunk. The English peppered moths do not land on tree trunks. Where then did these pictures come from? Well, they would go out and catch the English pepper moths that normally land under leaves, green, doesn't matter, they don't blend in anyway, and they would either pin them on the tree trunks, glue them on the tree trunks, or artificially place them on the tree trunks. Now you would think, oh, okay, if anybody knew that, 
they would not put this piece of information in a book, would they? If they knew it beforehand. If someone was apprised of the fact that these photographs were falsified or fraudulent or concocted, then you would think that they would not put it in a book. Well, I want you to read with me what Bob Ritter... Now, before you read the quotes from Bob Ritter, read who Bob Ritter is. He is a Canadian textbook writer who knew the moth pictures were fake. Now read what he says. Well, you have to look at the audience, he says. How convoluted do you want to make it for a first-time learner? Let me translate that. This is such an easy example to use, you don't want to confuse the kids. Okay, you would, however, like for the kids to actually get correct information, wouldn't you? Keep reading with me. Well, the advantage of this example of natural selection is that it is extremely visual. Great. Suppose evolution predicted that spiders would turn into, oh, let's say, um, whatever. Let's say lizards. Suppose we said evolution says that spiders will turn into lizards, but we've never seen an example of that, so we concoct an example, and then to justify using it, we say, well, it's so visual, it shows the point very well. Well, sure it shows the point very well. You made it up. So, of course, it shows the point very well because you designed it to show the point. Now, keep reading with me. Well, we want to get across the idea of selective adaptation. Later on, they, the students, can look at it more critically. Let me ask you a question. When is later on? Is it when they go to high school? Is it when they go to college? It's not any of those places. Here is a list of textbooks that this particular example is used in. Several of these are used in college classes. Folks, when is later on? That's what I want to ask Bob Ritter. When are the kids going to get the real story, the facts behind the evidence? When? You want to know the answer to that? On a Super Saturday, if somebody comes down and presents it to them, who believes in a God for the most part because you're not going to get it in your public school book. You're not going to get it in middle school or high school. You're not going to get it in college. And you're certainly not going to get it when you go, if you go to get a Ph.D. in any type of science. But when will they get to look at it critically? On a day like today is about the only time. Keep working through this textbook with me. You're looking at a man named Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel came, if if you see that date, 1860. He came right on the coattails of Charles Darwin. When Charles Darwin was pushing his new idea, Ernst Haeckel grabbed that idea and said, This is it. We have just discovered how everything in this universe came to be. I love this idea. So he started looking for evidence that supposedly would back up evolution. And lo and behold, he found it. He found it in the human embryo. And he made up this catchy little phrase. And the catchy little phrase is this. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And all of his students would come into his class and he would teach them that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And they would say, hmm, yes, that is right. Ontogeny does recapitulate phylogeny. And they would polyparrot this idea and they would use that phrase and it was a very, very popular idea. And here's all it says. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Okay, what does that mean? It means that the stages of an embryo's development, the ontogeny, an embryo developing, repeats its phylogeny, repeats its evolutionary steps. So here's what he said. If you look at a human embryo, you can watch it turn into different things that it evolved from. At 
at one time in the embryo's life, it's got something like little gill slits. At another time, it looks like the embryo of a dog. At another time, a salamander, etc. So he said, you can look at the human embryo, you can watch it develop its ontogeny, and you can see all the various stages of the human evolution. And for proof, people, of course, demanded proof, and so he gave it to them. Here they are. The pictures that Ernst Haeckel drew proving ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. I want to show you this page. Right here in the top left-hand corner, you will see pictures almost identical to the ones on the screen. I want to read to you the caption under this particular picture. The embryos of vastly different animals look quite similar during the earliest stages of development. These similarities in development hint at genes inherited from a common ancestor. Now, what was, back in 1860, 1870, 1880, what was the outcome of Ernst Haeckel's embryos? Did he prove to the world that a human embryo goes through its various stages of evolution? Well, I want to show you exactly what he did prove. On the bottom, you see the actual embryo, a photograph of the actual embryo. On the top, you see Ernst Haeckel's drawings. Now, I just like to draw your attention to the salamander. Does Ernst Haeckel's salamander look anything like the actual photograph of the salamander? Ernst Haeckel's professors knew this information. And so they had a tribunal at the University of Jena where he was a professor. Had a criminal, virtually criminal tribunal tried him tried him for fraud and guess what Ernst Haeckel admitted he said yeah I gotta admit that uh, several of these drawings I, I did the exact same drawing and labeled them three or four different animals other ones he said I didn't really even look at the embryo they convicted him of fraud in the late 1800's this idea was patently false from the very beginning. So let me ask you a question. Why is it on page 54 of Prince Hall Evolution book? We've known this was false for a hundred years. But the reason it's still here is the same reason that the English peppered moths are still here. This is all the M.O. that evolutionists have. This is their strongest case. This is the case that they are using to explain to your children that you are teaching falsehoods. Now, isn't that ironic? These are the evidences that they're using to explain to your children that you are teaching falsehoods about creation. But they've known these pictures and these embryos and these peppered moths have been fraudulent for. 25, 50, 100 years. Keep going with me. Just want to read this one to you. A set of 19th century drawings that still appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says the embryologist in Britain. Although Haeckel confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena, the drawings persist. That's the real mystery. And certainly it is. Here are the drawings used at the University of Western Florida in 1999. Folks, this stuff is being used all over the country in middle schools, high schools, and colleges. All over the country. Here is, there again, a list of biology books, of science books that are using Haeckel's drawings or some form or fashion of them. Keep going with me. Here is one of the books that is using Alton Biggs, Chris Kapika, and Linda Lundgren. This book is used 
in South Huntington School District in honors biology there in Huntington Station, New York. It's used in 1999. The Texas Board of Education adopted it as the biology textbook. And it's got Haeckel's embryos in it. Here you go. Biology, the unity and diversity of life. Used in Biology 110 at the University of Tennessee in Martin. Used in Biology 101, Central Michigan University. Remember when Bob Ritter said that later on they can look at this stuff critically? You can see that it's not later on in college, can't you? Keep going with me. You've heard of the missing link. Charles Darwin, when he wrote The Origin of Species by Natural Selection in 1859, said this about the missing link. He said, when we look into the geological record, we should find innumerable transitional stages of animals. That means we should find an animal that's got a half scale, half feather, like a skether. Or we should find an animal that has a half, oh, half leg, half fin, like a, a lin, or something of that sort. In fact, Darwin said we should find count innumerable transitional stages. So they asked him, of course, why don't we? He said, well, the reason that we don't find them is we haven't dug up enough fossils. He said, I'm convinced that in the years to come when we dig up more fossils, we will find these transitional phases. What do we call these transitional phases? Missing links. Why do we still call them missing links? They're still missing. But now several have been put forth as the miss... Uh, this is it. For instance... This is a picture of what is called a, a lobe-finned fish. This fish was called an index fossil. There, supposedly 325 to 410 million years ago. Here's what that means. If you found the bones, and this, by the way, particular one is a coelacanth. That's the name of it. If you found the bones of this particular lobe-finned fish, the coelacanth, then whatever you found around that was supposed to be 325 to 410 million years old. So let's say you're digging around, you find the bones of this particular fish, the lobed fin fish, and here's why they said it was the missing link. It's got front fins that are short and stubby, and they almost look like legs. So they said that's the missing link. That is the fish that swim close to the surface and his stubby little fins allowed him to waddle up onto land, and somehow he developed oxygen things that like something like a lung that could change air into the oxygen that he needed instead of the gills, etc. He developed and evolved. But those little lobed fins that look like more like a leg than a fin, that's what keys us into knowing that this guy was the missing link. Anything they found around this particular fossil was supposed to be 325 to 410 million. That's why it's called an index fossil. Okay, that's all well and good. Until. Until in 1938, on December the 24th, Christmas Eve off the coast of Madagascar, they, uh, they, uh, Pulled one up. It was about five feet long, weighed about 100 pounds. They talked to fishermen in Indonesia. They said, yeah, but we've been catching these for years. We call them the lizards of the sea. Did you ever read where the evolutionists went back through all of their dating and said, we have misnamed an index fossil called the coelacanth. Everything that we said that we found around that we said was 325 million years old. We need to go back and change all that because we have just found, to date, we found more than 100 of them. Did you ever read about that? I didn't either. Never read a single stitch of writing about where they went back and changed it. Do you know what finding the coelacanth fish was like? It was better than finding a live dinosaur. You know, we said that the dinosaur supposedly died out in 65 million years ago. The silicon supposedly died out 325 million years ago, and we found one. And so we threw out evolution because it didn't go with... No. No, we didn't. We just said, oh, we must have been wrong, and now they've changed to some other animal. Now it's the lung fish. 
Folks, let me ask you a question. Why was the lobe thin fish, why were they so eager to say that that was the missing link? Because they need it. They need transitional stages, but they still don't have them. Let me give you another example. This is a trilobite. Funny little creature. They came in all shapes and sizes. Some of them were as big as, uh, as big as your hand. Others were about the size of a nickel or a quarter. Trilobites were supposedly index fossils for about 450 to 500 million years ago. Let's refer back to our textbook. Our textbook here, here is a picture of several trilobites. Here is what the text under these trilobites has to say. Creatures of the Paleozoic seas, including starfish and trilobites, are in these particular pictures. Now, where does this book say the Paleozoic age started and was? Let me read this to you. Your imaginary trip has brought you to the Paleozoic era. The time is 570 million years ago. And even a quick glance alerts you to the fact that the land is still lifeless. But then supposedly after about 70, 100 million years, about 470 million years ago, here come the trilobites. Now, trilobites are index fossils for the Paleozoic time period. Anything you find around a trilobite is supposed to be 400 million years old, right? 1968, a man by the name of William Meister was in Utah, Antelope Springs, Utah, and it was June, and I think it was June the 1st. And he was looking for trilobites. And he climbed a cliff, and his rock hammer hit a particular rock that was sealed together. That rock fell onto the ground and cracked open showing two sides virtually identical to each other. And there he found exactly what he was looking for, a trilobite. But he also found something that he did not expect to find. What do we got going here? He found that trilobite buried in a human shoe print. My colleague has been to the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, took this particular picture, and says if you look close enough, you can see the stitches of the shoe print. Now, we look on the Internet to see how the evolutionists explain this. They say, oh yes, it's a trilobite, but it just so happens that that particular shape is a very common shape that rocks break apart into. You know they don't give us any pictures of this being such a very common shape that rocks break into. We don't see, oh, here are six other examples. Folks, that is a shoe print. Now, how old is that shoe print supposed to be if a trilobite is an index fossil? 400 million years old. What's that do to the evolutionary dating system? It eradicates 397 million years. And that's in our textbook. Keep going with me. And I think you're starting to see that somebody is feeding some children some falsehoods. And it's not those of us who are teaching creation. This one, I think, is particularly interesting. This was from Time Magazine. And this gives us the dawn of man. Now, read this with me. The discovery of a handful of bones in Ethiopia bring scientists tantalizingly close to the time six million years ago when our most ancient ancestors took their first upright steps. Now I want you to look at the creature on the right. How's he standing? Oh, upright. That man right there, or whatever he is, is walking in the woods. Now I want to give you this creature's name, Artipithecus romidus cadaba. Words that supposedly mean basal root ancestor. This is supposed to be the first one. Very, very close to the first one. Now, now look. 
Well, researchers haven't really collected enough bones yet to reconstruct with precision what he looked like. Okay, did they want you to think they knew what he looked like when they drew that picture? Yes, but they haven't reconstructed enough bones to tell you what he looked like yet. Now, here are the bones of Artipithecus Romulus Cadala. You've got, put them all together, they're chips and slices of bones here and there, but you've got about all, uh, found 11 specimens. Now read this, from five different individuals. So you're averaging about two bones per individual. Now, keep going with me. Here is, now this was in the, the fold of Time magazine. This was the toe bone. Now read that. This is the toe bone that proves this creature walked on two legs. This is the toe bone. It proves it. You know how many bones you got in your feet? 26 bones in each foot. Have you ever looked at some of the variations in toes that we've got in just the human population right now? You could find a toe bone, probably, if you looked hard enough, that looked very similar to that. Or you could find a toe bone in somebody that, that didn't look a thing like that at all. You could not prove from a single toe bone if this creature walked on two legs or not. But now, let me show you what else is very, very interesting about this toe bone. Read with me. Well, not only was the toe bone separated in time of several hundred thousand years, but it was also found some ten miles away from the rest of it. Okay, this is the toe bone that proves that this creature walked upright, except this toe bone doesn't really match any other bones, and the way that they've dated it, which was probably false anyway, but the way that they've dated it, it's several hundred thousand years younger than the rest of them. Oh, and by the way, we found it 10 miles away from all the rest of them too. Are you starting to see what's happening here? They pick tiny little pieces of information that they want to plug into their system, but if you really start looking at the system, you realize that this is no proof at all. Folks, they found two bones from each individual. The toe bone that they said proved that it walked upright, except the toe bone they said was separated by several hundred thousand years, and they found it 10 miles away. Get in your car, go 60 miles an hour for 10 minutes, and then stop, pick up a bone, and then connect it to one that was sitting here. I think you're starting to see some of the evidence for evolution is not all that solid. I want you to read with me. A quote from a... Don't, don't start reading it yet. I just want you to read the top. Colin Patterson was the senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History in 1979, 1980, around that period. Now, here's what it means to be the senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History. You know more about fossils than probably anyone else in the world. If you didn't, you wouldn't get to be the senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History. Now, I want you to read with me what Colin Patterson said in a lecture that he traveled around and gave. Here's what he said. He said, I think always before in my life, when I've got up to speak on the subject, I've been confident of one thing, that I know more about it than anybody in the room because I've studied it. Well, this time it isn't true. I'm speaking on two subjects, evolutionism and creationism. And I believe it's safe to say that I know nothing whatever about either one of them. One of the reasons I started taking this anti-evolutionary view, or let's call it a non-evolutionary view, was that last year I had a sudden realization. For over 20 years I thought I had been working on evolution in some way. One morning I woke up and something happened in the night and it struck me that I'd been working on this stuff for over 20 years. And I didn't know a thing about it. Well, it's quite a shock to learn that one can be misled for so long. Either there was something wrong with me or there was something wrong with evolutionary theory. Naturally, I know there's nothing wrong with me. So for the last few weeks, I've tried putting a simple question to various people and groups. Question is, can you tell me 
anything that you know about evolution. Anything, any one thing that is true. Delivered this to several very prominent scientists. One man raised his hand. He said, yes, sir, I can. He said, I know we shouldn't be teaching it in the schools as a fact. Amen to that. Folks, Daniel Denae said, he's going to take every opportunity to teach your children that you are lying to them. Well, I think it's time that we take every opportunity that we have to show in the creation-evolution debate who's really telling the truth and who's really spreading the falsehood. Thank you very much for your time.